Very good afternoon to all of you. It's always a pleasure to be here because it's a theater of learning. And always gratified by what our Dr. Jitendra Singh says. A man brings on the table huge experience. And he also reveals exposure to some of the most intractable situations with all you have grappled. Dr. Jitendra Singh, the Honorable Union Minister and Chairman IIPA, Sri Surendra Nath Tripathi ji, I was rightly indicated by Dr. Saab that when it comes to an IS officer, never ignore the best year. So, Sri Srinath Party, 1985 batch. <clears throat> Sri Sunil Kumar Gupta, 87 batch, secretary to vice president. Sri Sekhar Dadji, former governor. Dr. Harshwadanji, more than a former union minister. V. C. Nivasji, 1989. Dr. Ashok Prasadji, we are beholden to you. And also to Dr. Saab. Your presence means a lot. Grateful for your presence. Sri S.S. Chatriyaji, Sir, 1980. Am I right, sir? Asian, 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 it is indeed an honor and privilege to deliver the second Dr. Rajendra Prasad Memorial Lecture. In a sense, it is dream come true. Dr. Saab is remembered as the first president of the country. But what is more relevant and significant, he was chairman of the Constituent Assembly. And in that capacity, Dr. Saab said, highest standards that need to be exemplified by all. Friends, as you know, Constituent Assembly was in session at different levels for three years. And during those three years, the world witnessed some of the highest quality deliberations, dialogue, discussion, debate. One thing that was missing from that theater was disruption and disturbance. Something that was just not seen there was confrontation. It was always working in concert. As president of this Institute of National Repute, I acknowledge and appreciate that IIPA brings administration and scholarship together. When I came here for the first time, and I gathered all the details by thought-provoking discourse by Dr. Jitendraji. I have been keeping track of events. It's a fairly representative body, and the focus is in depth. In this Amrath Kal, and friends, the entire world is watching us in Amrath Kal. In this Amrath Kal, when the country is on the path of becoming the third largest economy of the world, we need scholarly foresight to aid administrative systems. It was in September 2022 when we had the honor of being the fifth largest economy on the planet. And that was a significant milestone also for the reason that in the process we overtook our colonial rulers. In recent years, the profile of civil administration has changed. It has become socially, 
more inclusive without meaning any disrespect to anyone a very significant change has taken place in power corridors in the last 8 9 years it has been sanitized of power brokers it has been sanitized of people who could leverage governance through extra legal means and this is a great achievement that is having impactful reflection in our governance young talent from remote villages from humble families from marginalized communities is joining civil services i have had the occasion to interact with trainees and i can tell you being myself from a village having seen what education means and how difficult it is to get it when i found the profile of those young trainees this observation is a ground reality these young people have closely seen the positive role that public administration plays in eradicating poverty and improving chances of realizing their full potential a big change that has taken place i can tell my young friends that we have evolution of an ecosystem now thanks to affirmative government policies that one is now unable to fully exploit his or her talent gone are the days when a young person could not translate idea into reality because lack of financial support or government policy coming in the way that situation has 100% gone it is also heartening to see that more and more talented young girls are joining civil services ready to face the challenges of public administration it is not only limited to civil service the presence of this gender is being seen in all walks of life including defense and their performance is now becoming increasingly envy of my gender and those who are from my gender i can assure you time has come when you need to give your best because you face a challenge which is formidable today friends india is on the rise and i would say india is on the rise as never before the rise of india is unstoppable it is inspired by surge of aspirations and innovations and validated by the achievements of our citizens friends certain things are happening in a very silent manner for example the concept of smart cities but look at what has happened with smart cities you will feel the difference another facet aspirational districts identification of those districts that were challenged to the people living there and as the honorable prime minister once reflected no one wanted to be district magistrate of that district now they seek to be there because they are inspired to deliver and things are changing look at from global perspective people who know the world who know the economy who know the developments that are taking place all around we are favorite global destination of opportunity innovation and investment and why not we approved it our 90000 innovators startups are the partners in this astounding phenomenal success in this scenario expectations of the people are bound to go up and they must go up as citizen expectations and requirements evolve and transform on the basis of development achievement norms it is heartening to note the service delivery efficiencies and satisfaction levels are showing tangible results just reflect a few years back there used to be long queues to make payments we don't see them anymore 
At a global level, we are a country that has effected unprecedented direct transfer to the citizen. And not only to the citizen, to a vulnerable class also, be it farmer or women working in Angan bodies. And that's a big achievement and a big relief. Direct transfer gets rid of human interface that has been capitalizing on those who needed resources or made available resources by the government but could have no access to them, there was something like middleman. This institution of middleman has disappeared. Dr. Harshwardhan is a keen student of science, sir, we don't need to retrieve them. Extinction of the institution of middleman is fine. Today, the mantra of New India is less government, more governance. The executive facilitating ease of doing business with the larger objective of ease of living. I have seen it myself because as governor of the state of West Bengal, I was heading a group of 10 governors on ease of governance, ease of doing business. And we engaged into serious deliberative session. And this is happening in every walk of life. But these are subterranean silent developments that impact us hugely and that help us optimize our working capacity. The next 25 years are going to be crucial for the country. They are going to be crucial for the country, particularly for, because of last nine years. In last nine years, we have laid a foundation by series of affirmative steps that in, 1940, in 2047, where the country will be celebrating centenary of independence, we have to be at number one. And my young friends, my young friends will be there as warriors of 2047. Some of us may not be around, but we all are very confident the kind of ecosystem that has come to be evolved and kind of stability that has come to be afforded, there is no doubt India will be number one in the world at that point of time. Friends, governance is a dynamic concept and public administrators have to remain in tune with the changing expectations and requirements of citizens. Let me tell you, when there was telecom revolution, there was great rele relevance to the telephone booth. It has gone. That telephone booth that really changed our working pattern is no longer there. The mobile has replaced it. And those of you who are from tier two cities or villages, no marriage was complete without VCR, without VCD, that's gone. Even a Radhiwala will not take it for 50 rupees. So governance is indeed dynamic, and so are the demands and expectations of the people, and corresponding obligation on those who have to deliver, those who are in the seat of governance. In coming years, emerging technologies like digital platforms Artificial intelligence, big data science, and internet of things will be an essential part of administration to meet demands of an Alma uh, Atam Nirbhar economy as we become the hub of global value chain to facilitate a new entrepreneurial culture and to support innovative startups. Friends, another important qualitative facet of incursion of technology in our governance and life is subjectivity is reduced. The element of discretion uh, is curved and contained. And we have immediate data which immediately indicates wrong discretion or discriminatory approach. 
what has happened in our country is that involvement of technology in governance is exponent, exponential. As someone called it, explosively exponential during Modi regime. His emphasis on technological innovation, technological involvement has been absolutely with a passion and a mission. In the last two years during the COVID, not only did we gear up our own capacity to develop and produce medicines, equipments and vaccines, set up hospitals, oxygen plants, we also developed digital platforms to monitor the spread of pandemic and provided all citizens with digital certificates of vaccination. I share with you the joy. And when world leaders looked at me, when I told them, in my country, Bharat, 220 crore people have vaccination certificates on their mobile. Even the best and most developed country in the world cannot lay such a claim. The government ensured that healthcare and social security was made available equitably, efficiently, and promptly to every citizen. Look at when we had that healthcare will be provided to citizens. It was just not giving fiscal assistance. You would have more medical colleges, more hospitals, more diagnostic centers, more para medical staff, nursing colleges. So there was some kind of a plateau development in the health sector. And that has really been of greatest assistance to us when pandemic challenged us. India's medical prowess was acknowledged. And sir, you know it, Dr. Harshwadhan and the Honorable Minister. We are rightly called the pharmacy of the world. I will add an adjective to that. We are the most effective pharmacy of the world, giving the best value for money without compromising quality. When pandemic COVID challenged us, we did not forget our civilizational ethos. We supported more than 100 countries by making available our vaccines and to many of them as friendly gesture. Many people were worried what will happen during COVID, particularly with respect to food security. No governance in the world can lay a claim which this country has vindicated on ground. From April 1, 2020, rice, cereal, pulse are available to 800 million people. And that continues. What could be a more caring governance in difficult times? While all this is happening, friends, I need to share, and I cannot help myself, but to share it with you all. Worrying trend before this August house. An intense assault on India's values, integrity, and its institutions is emanating from well-maintained incubator out to the famous. An ecosystem is being shaped and nurtured to combat India's growing global power. It is the favorite theme of some outside institutions to attack India's legitimacy as a nation state and its constitution. Now, what I'm saying next I must preface it. I have highest regard for our industries. They are contributing to the growth of the nation. But even best of minds sometimes need to be cautioned. Indian billionaires, some of them, and intellectuals, unmindful of consequences of fallen prey to such pernicious designs, 
by funding these institutions. Their benevolence can be more fruitfully utilized if they make financial contributions to our institutes of excellence, IITs, IAMs, rather than go outside. There is a need to reflect seriously on it. Why do they do it? I firmly believe as an individual, whatever CSR fund is, it must be utilized within the country. I don't want to give out figures, but when I come to know that 200 crores have been given by a billionaire to an institute in the US, or in 2008, the government of India itself gave around 20 crores to another institution, we need to revisit our thought process. We do not need certification from anyone. We do not need approval from anyone. The best calibration has to be within the country by our own people, and we know the best. Elites in industry and intelligentsia, I make a fervent appeal to them to be thoughtful. This is certainly not accusatory. It is just caution because their intent is certainly not against India, but they have to be a little more inspired to look within the country for their such contribution, contributions. Friends, first president of the Republic of India, Rajendra Babu, was closely associated with the making of our constitution, as I said in the beginning. As chairman Rajya Sabha, I relate to him. I remember him virtually every day. He, he must have had something very special in him, that he created a situation in the Constituent Assembly where most contentious issues, divisive issues, were thrust out by deliberation, dialogue, discussion, and debate. And there was no disruption. Not to speak of what we see these days, the spectacle of coming to the web, showing flags. I appeal to the political spectrum of this country. Never underestimate the intellect of the people. They know all that is happening. They are very discerning. Nothing can be more concerning for them that when parliament is maintained by public exchequer at huge cost, and it doesn't function day after day. That is very painful to them. They withstand it. They want to hold us accountable. How paradoxical it is. They send representatives in parliament to hold the government accountable, and they are entertaining a different thought at the moment. Divergent views. Parliament is a place for divergent views, indigestible views, reflection of the other point of view. There can be no greater freedom of expression for an individual than in Parliament. For a simple reason, there is immunity provided to parliamentarians from civil and criminal action. I recollect what Dr. Rajendra Prasad said on 26 November 1949, that's an important date, because on that day, he delivered his valedictory address to the Constituent Assembly and his observations in my humble assessment have turned out to be prophetic. He says, every succession generation, successive generation must remember, I quote, and mind you, those times, his position, what he had seen before his own eyes for three years, 
and the constitution had crystallized contentious issues had come to be determined he says i quote a constitution like a machine is a lifeless thing it acquires life because of the men who control it and operate it and india needs today nothing more than a set of honest men who will have the interest of the country before them and court through this platform i call upon parliamentarians to introspect and reflect on what babu rajendra prasad ji said in this amrit kal of our independence we should make honest appraisal in the backdrop of rajendra babu's serious observations i have no doubt that all three gun, three organs of the state derive their legitimacy from the constitution it is expected of these institutions organs to be in collaborative synergy to achieve the constitutional objectives as enunciated in the preamble of the constitution constitutional governance is about achieving dynamic equilibrium in the healthy interplay among the three organs friends there will always be issues there will be issues between the legislature the executive and the judiciary they are bound to be there because we are in dynamic times but all these issues have to be determined in a structured manner keeping in view the spirit of the constitution a sense of constitution and certainly not through confrontation the democratic polity bestows law making power primarily upon the elected legislature that reflects expectations and aspirations of the people i have never been in doubt neither rajya sabha nor lok sabha can script a judgment of the supreme court that is not the job of parliament that is the exclusive domain of the judiciary similarly there are certain exclusive preserves for the executive and the legislature there is urgent need for these institutions to scrupulously adhere to their respective domain there exists a clear separation of power among these three wings of the constitution primacy of mandate of the people and why i focus on that in democracy it is will of the people that has to prevail in our constitution and mechanism this mandate of the people is reflected through their representatives on legitimate constitutional platform and this friends according to me is inviolable legislation is the exclusive privilege of the parliament and is not required to be analyzed assessed intervened by any other theater and any attempt to undermine the intent of legislature would amount to a situation which will not be wholesome and it will also upset the delicate equilibrium i had indicated about constructive dialogue but now since we have seen in public domain that there are reflections emanating from those at the helm of these institutions in public domain i would appeal that a serious thought be bestowed on evolution of a structured mechanism so that those at the helm of these institutions are in a position to periodically exchange their thought process and that will generate bonhomi much needed for the country i would make a reference to national judicial appointments commission as an example 
there was near unanimity in parliament the entire lok sabha voted for it there was no abstention in rajya sabha there was no opposition there was one abstention as constitutionally required 16 state legislatures endorsed it the honorable president of the country invoking her constitutional authority under article triple one signed it and it took the shape of a constitutional prescription i as chairman rajya sabha wonder what happened to it no one has reverted to us i am sure institutes like you and the people present here the intelligence of intelligence of the country would be to attention on this basic of any basic structure which is being often talked about is the supremacy of parliament which means supremacy of the people in law making regarding the issue of concurrence of chief justice of india in the selection of judges i i say so when we had our constitution given to us by such illustrious constituent assembly presided by dr rajendra babu the constitutional pres prescription was consultation by a judicial order this consultation became concurrence i want institutions like this particularly in the presence of dr jitendra singh because of article 370 article 370 is one article in our constitution that uses the words concurrence and consultation both which means framers of the indian constitution were aligned irrespective of the meaning of the lexicon to these words that there is fundamental difference between consultation and concurrence judiciary held consultation would be concurrence on that i am reminded what dr ambedkar had on 24th may 1949 in constituent assembly and what he said i quote with regard to the question of the concurrence of the chief justice it seems to me that those who advocate that proposition friends they discussed it they deliberated it that there should be concurrence they reflected on it and what they said is those who advocate the proposition seem to be rely implicitly both on the impartiality of the chief justice and the soundness of his judgment and dr ambedkar goes on to say i quote i personally feel no doubt that the chief justice is a very eminent person and we have one at the moment a man with unimpeachable credentials a man of great learning a man who has a track record of being exposed to legal nuances nationally and globally we have one at the moment he says i personally feel no doubt that chief justice is a very eminent person but after all the chief justice is a man with all the failings all the sentiments and all the prejudices which we as common people have and i think now is the significant observation by dr b r ambedkar to allow the chief justice practically a veto upon the appointment of judges is really to transfer the authority to the chief justice which we are not prepared to veto the president or the government of the day i therefore think that it is also a dangerous preposition and quote friends there are people who do not share blossoming of democracy in our country who do not share our joy of emerging economy who do not wish to relish our growth trajectory and they therefore want to throw a spanner and they do it by taking to social media writing articles and holding seminars in the country and mostly outside the country also 
including in institutions that are by a large fiscally assisted by our billionaires. And that being the situation, I would urge we have to be extremely alert because if we do not act in time and we observe silence, then those who observe silence for too long, even if they are in majority, then the silent majority will be silenced and we cannot afford to do that. Another aspect on which I want intelligentsia and people at large to put pressure on the political ecosystem. We don't have to look all issues with political partisan prism. We cannot afford. For example, a judicial judgment can't be seen in political or partisan instance. It has to be seen in the context of a decision by judiciary. In that perspective, I appeal and I find it imperative that members of legislature must distinguish themselves between legislative obligations and party compulsions. No one can be more intimately associated with parties and stance where public interest is required as the one who sits in my chair, either myself or deputy chairperson. Prolonged disruptions and disturbances as part of political strategy cannot be appreciated. How can something which is antithetical to a sense of democracy, it dilutes our democratic values, can be a political strategy. Our legislative bodies must provide leadership lay down ideological contours for public policy and guide the public administration for larger welfare of the society. And I say, with a sense of caution and concern, if the temples of democracy, the theatres where debate should be the main thing, if they yield to disruption, disturbance, there will be people around to fill the vacuum. And that for any governance or democracy will be a dangerous trend. The issues that are facing the country are required to be thrust out and debated in the theatres. If they don't do it, someone else will do the job. And that will be not in consonance with the spirit of the Constitution and we'll be unnecessarily straining our founding fathers in heaven that we gave you such a precious document and you have taken recourse to something which is not available. Friends, Dr. Rajendra Prasad had expected a set of honest men with interest of country before them to run India. We are having governance of which Dr. Rajendra Babu will be proud. Our bureaucracy is very different now than what it was a decade ago. We have power corridors, as I said, fully sanitized. We have seen those times where a particular position in the government used to be a really important position. But now that bureaucratic position is only a position of carrying out certain obligations. His one dream is coming true. In Amrit Kal, I expect everyone to ensure the cherished values of Babu Rajinder Prashad are not spoken by us, they are practiced by us. Friends, it is heartening to note that there is increasing reflection of the human face of government's governance visible from more inclusive growth guided by the spirit of Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Viswas, Sabka Priyas. I thought many times, should I be saying so? Because there are people around to sensualize that the Honorable Vice President has said so. What does he mean by it? I'm a citizen of this country. 
I hold a constitutional office. It is with firm conviction, deep belief that I use these words because these have become a ground reality in the largest democracy on the planet. I wish all of you very well in your endeavors and thank the IIPA chairman and director general for affording me this rare opportunity to share my thoughts by delivering this lecture one in the name of one of the greatest sons of the soil who by his conduct i'm concluding who by his conduct was always pristine unimpeachable impeccable where I, I, whenever it came to issues that others would think twice i don't want to take you to those episodes but they are indelibly imprinted in our hearts thank you so much